The Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023 meeting of the Eden Prairie City Council is now called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. It's nice this evening to see a full house. We don't uh, get that a whole lot, especially a full house of smiling people. <laughs> um, we occasionally, we'll get the full house of um, not so smiling people, which is also good for democracy, but especially nice tonight to have all of you here. So thank you. I do realize that uh, after the awards are given out, many of you will get up and leave this meeting and go down for a reception, I believe, downstairs. So nice to have you here as long as you are. And um, you are welcome to stay. It's pretty exciting, council meetings. But you can go home and watch them from home as well. So we're going to move the... I thought we were going to move the award to the last item in our <laughs> agenda. Ah, <laughs> no. You all will stay first. PG wanted to move you to the end to make you stay, but I'm not going to do that to you, so... You just lost the next election, by the way. <laughs> Uh, at least these people's votes. Um, I was just joking. <laughs> during um, the beginning of the meeting, I read an open podium invitation. So I want to uh, read that this evening. Open podium is an opportunity for Eden Prairie residents to address the city council on issues related to Eden Prairie city government prior to each council meeting. The council meetings typically occur the first and third Tuesday of each month. We're going into summer schedule, though, for the next three months after this. Um, and these open podium times occur from 6.30 to 6.55 p.m. here in the council chamber. If you wish to speak at open podium, please contact the city manager's office at 952-949-8412 by noon of the meeting date with your name, your phone number, and subject matter so we can be better prepared for you. Open podium is not recorded or televised. This meeting right now is, however. Uh, if you have questions about open podium, please do contact the city manager's office. Mr. Getro, we have um, some, um, we always have, I think, exciting proclamations and presentations, but um, particularly so this evening. So I'll turn it over to you. Yes, Mayor, thank you. We do have a, quite a few uh, number of presentations, and we're going to kick off with um, one that our police chief is going to lead us through. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, I'm uh, proud to award a letter of recognition tonight for some life saving measures at our community center. So I'd like to call up. Uh, Community Center, community center uh, workers, Elisa Huang, Marie Grogan, Jill Bickler, Doug Tory, Doug Tucker, sorry, Nate Story, and then Community Center patron Matt Johnson, if you could all join me up here. And I'd also like to call up Peter Graff, who was the recipient of these life-saving measures, if you could join me as well. And we'll uh, read to the council here. You can go on both sides, whatever works. All right. A letter of recognition. At 3 p.m. on March 8, 2023, Peter Graff was on a stationary bike at the Eden Prairie Community Center when he experienced a cardiac event and fell off the bike. Elisa Huang, an off-duty EPCC fitness instructor, witnessed him fall and immediately called for help. EPCC fitness leads Marie Gorgon and Jill Bickler raced over and began moving the bikes that were impeding their access to Peter. In addition, they checked his vitals and called 911. EPCC patron Matt Johnson noticed the commotion and retrieved a nearby AED along with Marie. Recreation Supervisor Doug Tucker and Recreation Specialist Nate Story also arrived on scene. Matt, Doug, and Nate then performed CPR and administered shocks using the AED. By the time officers arrived, Peter had received four shocks from the AED. Peter received three additional shocks by the officers and firefighters. He was then taken by Gurney to an ambulance where he began speaking with the paramedics. Thanks to the quick thinking actions of these six individuals, Peter is alive and well. The EPCC staff relied on their training, remained calm, and worked together to stay focused on saving Peter's life. Patron Matt jumps, Johnson jumped into action as soon as he saw that Peter needed help. His actions were selfless and vital in assisting Eden Prairie Community Center staff. For the heroic efforts in saving Peter Graff's life, I hereby award Alyssa Huang, Marie Grogan, 
Jill Bickler, Doug Tucker, Nate Story, and Matt Johnson with this letter of recognition. Senior awareness. There you go. All right. Yeah, Mary, you could stay down there. Um, so yeah, we've got um, some more recognition and some more awards. We have the our annual Human Rights Awards. So at approximately this meeting every year, our Human Rights and Diversity Commission members are part of presenting um, at least three Human Rights Awards to residents of our community. I don't know the, um, all of the commissioners that are presenting, but I know our chair, Greg Leeper, is going to kick things off and we're gonna move it from um, to each winner and each participant. So um, welcome, Mr. Leeper. Right, thank you, Mr. Getcho. All right, well, the Eden Prairie Manifesto supports the continued development of a multicultural community which, one, does not tolerate acts of harassment or intolerance, Two, establishes, communicates, and encourages community standards that respect diversity. And three, promotes acceptance and respect for individuals in an atmosphere of caring for others. In celebration of the manifesto, we are honored tonight to recognize individuals, youth, and a nonprofit that lives its values through their service to our community. We'll begin by welcoming our individual award recipient and the presenter to the podium. Hello, Mayor. Uh, hello, Council. M my name is Kuhu, Kuhu Singh, and I'm the Commissioner on Human Rights and Diversity. And today I'm presenting um, the individual award, and it's my absolute honor to present Belia Jimenez Lorente. Um, and before I give her the award, I want to read a little bit about her. Uh, it's, it's so uh, wonderful and it's so inspiring to know about her and to know the work she's doing, and it's my absolute joy. Um, Belia Jimenez Lorente upholds the values of the Eden Prairie Manifesto through her dedication to supporting students, families, and staff at Eden Prairie schools. As a cultural liaison, Belia serves as a bridge between the school community and the Latinx culture. The families that Belia serves feel more connected to our school community because they know that she is there to support them. Belia creates a welcoming atmosphere in the biggest and smallest ways. One can always walk by her room and see her laughing and talking with our Latinx families. Students often eat lunch with her as a safe place for them to connect with one another in their common language. Teachers and other staff feel her welcoming presence and seek out her assistance to strengthen the homeschool connection with Latinx families. Belia is an incredible source of knowledge to the staff of Oak Point Elementary and beyond. Uh, from ensuring that families understand the daily activities happening in the classroom to ensuring that staff are equipped to create linguistically and culturally inclusive spaces for students. The impact that Belia has on students, families, and staff is immeasurable, and we are honored to recognize her here tonight. 
Uh, so it's my absolute honor, Belia Jimenez Lorente. Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm Hina Kazama, a student commissioner on the HRDC this year, and it is our honor to present Jermel Taylor with the Human Rights Award in the youth category. Jermel upholds the values of the Eden Prairie Manifesto through his role as a leader and mentor to his peers. As a student athlete, he has worked to coach and train younger athletes in our community. He worked with his teammates to raise over $14,000 to support the Minneapolis North Polar's football team with needed equipment. In the summer of 2022, he helped lead an initiative that packaged and delivered over 20,000 meals to nonprofits in North Minneapolis. Those who know him describe him as a young man with an amazing heart that inspires, encourages, and drives change for the better. He influences others around him without even knowing from his presence, his attitude, and most importantly, with his values and what he believes in. Jermel lives out the manifesto in his life every day with zero tolerance for acts of harassment and intolerance. Jermel is a shining example of a young person striving to build a stronger community, and we look forward to seeing where his path takes him. Good evening, Mayor. I know you're standing over there. I don't see you up here. And good evening, Council Members. My name is Sana Alazar. I serve on the Human Rights and Diversity Commission. Tonight, it is my honor and privilege to announce this year's recipient in the nonprofit category as Chain Reaction Theater Project. A little bit about what Chain Reaction Theater is uh, and how they uphold the Eden Prairie Manifesto. Chain Reaction upholds the Eden, Mar Eden Perry Manifesto by creating entertaining and thought-provoking performances that focus on social justice issues. Their performances are based on lived experience, ranging in scope, uh, ranging in scope from local to global issues. Examples of some of their past performances include human rights issues such as human sex trafficking, youth, youth homelessness, and white privilege. Additionally, Chain Reaction deepens the impact of their work by partnering with local nonprofits who work directly on the issues represented during the productions. Post show talkback sections and uh, sessions engage audience participation, encourage them to reflect on the themes discussed during the performance and ground the work in the reality of how each issue impacts communities near and far. Personally, having attended many of their performances, I can attest to the fact that these have fostered conversation in our community, increased awareness about issues, inspired and encouraged audiences and communities to take action. They are indeed a link fostering change in community. We are grateful for all the work that they do and look forward to the next production. With that, I would like to invite Executive Director of Chain Reaction Theatre, Shelley Smith, to come to the podium, accept the award, and say a few words if she so desires. Shelley, if you are interested. Um, I, I really appreciate um, this. This is quite the honor I, and unexpected. <laughs> um, I don't know what more to say, but come to a sh our next show. Now I'm working on environmental issues because I think that that's the most important thing I can do right now because I want to leave our earth a better place for our youth.
just want to make a brief comment about the Eden Prairie Manifesto, um, which is a document that um, both acknowledges, recognizes, celebrates, protects uh, diversity within our community. And I don't know exactly where we fell in the order of cities across the state that that produced such a document, but I'm guessing we were one of the first, and I know that it was during Mayor Jean Harris's uh, time, I believe, is there a date attached to it, 95, 96, 97, something, but it's over. Earlier than that, earlier than that I believe. Is it, yeah. It's over 25 years for sure that we have been um, acknowledging the value uh, of diversity um, within our community uh, and celebrating it. So I'm proud of that. Um, I think tonight is a representation showing um, how much we do appreciate um, the, the, the diversity. And I know that there are still, I won't name them, but still some of our sister communities around us that do not have a Human Rights and Diversity Commission. And so we've had that for, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, and so I, I just, again, feel such pride in Eden Prairie that we were uh, way ahead of the game, um, I believe, in acknowledging and recognizing the value of diversity. Okay. Uh, Mr. Getro, where are we at here? So, Yeah, Mayor, we've got a couple more items that I would think are focused in that HRDC realm as well. Um, you know, and thanks to the quick work of our uh, city attorney, um, the this we're celebrating 30 years um, with the manifesto. Okay. So that would have been 1993. You were close, Mayor. So we're going on, on 30 years. And then the HRDC, uh, Eden Prairie has had an HRDC since before I was born. You're pretty young too, but that but I get your point a little bit. 1968. Long time ago. 1968. Um, but that being said, Mayor, we have um, a, a project that they've been working on. The group has been working on um, for the um, convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, um, known as CETA. And so this is an initiative um, that our HRDC has heard about. They spent um, some meeting time discussing and they have a proclamation that they brought, brought forward for you to read. And I do know, and I don't know if you want to do the proclamation first, or um, our commissioner, uh, Brenda Fanal, is here to speak on the issue. I'm not sure if you, you want to go first. Okay, so Brenda's here to give some background on the issue, and then there's a proclamation for you to read, Mayor. Perfect. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Case and Council members. My name is Brenda Fottel, and I'm a member of the Human Rights and Diversity Commission. And while the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed in 1948, this important treaty did not specifically address discrimination against women. Thus, CEDA, which stands for the Convention on the Elimination on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, was passed by the United Nations, but not until 1979. It essentially acts as a women's bill of rights. You might wonder why an international treaty would be of interest to the Eden Prairie community and why the Human Rights and Diversity Commission recommended this proclamation, which is before council this evening. <clears throat> now, we know that progress and change often come from national and international bodies, from the top down, if you will. But change is also made as a groundswell from the community level. Thus, change comes from both directions. Further, while CEDA has been adopted by the United Nations, and most UN member countries around the world have all adopted CEDA. In the United States, there have been several failed attempts for ratification which have not made it past our Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Now, with regards to the US Senate, it's worth mentioning that throughout our entire history as a nation, only 59 women have been elected as members of Senate. And currently, 25 of the 100 members of our Senate are women. Thus, it's possible that we need more women elected to Senate before we can pass CEDA as a nation. Thus, individual communities across the country have chosen to put their support behind CEDA. In Minnesota, the cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, Red Wing, Richfield, and Edina have all passed resolutions of support. And it will be very satisfying for Eden Prairie to become the seventh city in Minnesota to put its support behind CEDA. By ratifying this proclamation, Eden Prairie adds its voice to advocating for women's rights and for the elimination of all forms of gender discrimination. Now, before I pass the, mayor back, or pass the mic back to Mayor Case, 
who will read the proclamation. I'd like to thank Eden Prairie residents Melanie Ouellette and Judge Tara Kalar for their advocacy in support of CEDAW before the Human Rights and Diversity Commission. And I'd especially like to thank Dr. Ellen Kennedy, the executive director of the nonprofit World Without Genocide. She happens to be, along with Judge Kalar, one of my former law school professors. She has advocated across Minnesota for years, advocating for CEDAW to be adopted by communities. Dr. Kennedy knocked on Eden Prairie's door twice now, first in 2020 and again this year, asking us to put our support behind CEDAW. So the advocacy of all three of these women made it very easy for the Human Rights and Diversity Commission to recommend this proclamation to council. Thank you. Thank you. So I will read the proclamation. Um, it's City of Eden Prairie, Hennepin County, Minnesota, in support of cities for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CETA, initiative in support of the principles of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women at the local level. Whereas, CETA was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on December 18, 1979, and became an international treaty as of September 3rd, 1981, and 189 UN member nations have agreed to be bound by CETA's provisions and, whereas all the women have made gains in the struggle for equality in many fields, much more needs to be accomplished to fully eradicate discrimination based on gender and to achieve one of the most basic human rights, equality. And whereas in 2014, Minnesota passed the Women's Economic Security Act, WISA, which included steps toward closing the gender pay gap, expanding family and sick leave for working families going on uh, in the House and Senate as we speak, helping older women be economically secure and providing support for women-owned small businesses, and whereas the Eden Prairie City Council supports the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and its aspiration for equal rights for all members of the human family, and whereas the Eden Prairie Manifesto, first adopted by the Eden Prairie City Council, there it is, in 19, if I had just read this ahead of time, in 1993, aligns with CETA in its dedication to upholding the rights of every individual in our community to freedom, dignity, and security, regardless of religious affiliation, race, ethnic heritage, gender, age, sexual orientation, physical or mental ability or economic status, and whereas the Eden Prairie City Council accepted the Eden Prairie Human Rights and Diversity Commission's Race Equity Report in 2022, which complements the intentions of CETA in seeking to make our community more equitable and inclusive, and whereas the Eden Prairie City Council desires to ensure that women and girls who live in Eden Prairie enjoy all the rights and privileges and remedies that are bestowed on all people in the US no matter race, national origin, gender, or religious belief, and with a purpose to claim worldwide that Eden Prairie is a city within which women can thrive and a city that will not tolerate discrimination against women and girls or violence perpetrated against them in any form by any hand, and whereas CETA provides a comprehensive framework for governments to examine their policies and practices in relation to women and girls and to rectify discrimination based on gender, and whereas city and county governments have an appropriate and legitimate role affirming the importance of eliminating all forms of discrimination against women in communities as universal norms and to serve as guides for public policy. Now, therefore, <laughs> be it resolved on this day, May 2nd, 2023, that the Eden Prairie City Council proclaims support for the CETA and that the city of Eden Prairie is committed to eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls, to promoting the health and safety of women and girls, and to affording them equal ac academic, economic, and business opportunities in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Ronald A. Case, Mayor, on behalf of council members Kathy Nelson, Mark Freiberg, PJ Narayan, Nen, and Lisa Toomey. So Mr. Getcho, um, is this the same as voting in? Because the question was that we have not officially um, voted and adopted. So does this constitute that? Th that does, Mayor. It's okay. a proclamation. Got it. All right. Yay. That's um, exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, women. And well, they differentiate women and girls, but yeah, all female, well, you get what I'm saying. Um, we're, we're so excited um, for you and glad that Eden Prairie was part of this tonight.
Councilmember Ryan. Do we need to vote on this? Or? Uh, evidently not. Okay. It's the same as property. Can I just make another comment? Please. I think related to this, I think we should also consider for gay and transgender rights as well. Yeah, no, um, and that's covered in our manifesto, but if we want something specific or if we know of something, a bill or something, that's, uh, I, I don't disagree with you in the slightest. We can send that back to staff and see if we're covered or if we want to do something special. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Getcho, uh, we have some uh, donations. We do have some donations, Mayor, again, back to the HRDC, the Human Resource, or Human Resources, uh, Human Rights and Diversity um, Commission did a great job uh, this year of helping organize uh, the first IFTAR in the city of Eden Prairie that occurred in the garden room here um, at the city during Ramadan. And um, it wouldn't be possible without many of the donations that came in to put the event on. So we received donations from the Eden Prairie Crime Prevention Fund, the Eden Prairie Noon Rotary, the New American Development Center, and the Eden Prairie Community Foundation. So those um, four groups gave $500 each, and then we received $500 from an anonymous resident and another $400 from an anonymous resident. So um, it feels a little bit strange for me to do this. Usually it's Jay that's doing all the donations, but I'll, I'm covering this one on behalf of community development and, and human rights and diversity for um, the IFTAR event that we had. Excellent. Uh, Council, this does require a motion to accept. I'll move to adapt a resolution accepting the following donations for the IFTAR event. $500 from the Eden Prairie Crime Prevention Fund, $500 from the Eden Prairie Noon Rotary, $500 from the New American Development Center, $500 from the Eden Prairie Community Foundation, $500 from an anonymous resident, and $400 from an anonymous resident. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, Mr. Getcho, I believe you'll turn it right over to Mr. Lathammer. Yes, I will, Mayor. Thank you for Senior Awareness Month. Mayor, Council members, uh, traditionally uh, we celebrate uh, Senior Awareness Month in May, and there are many different events that are occurring throughout the month. I would refer people to our website. We've got a really good calendar to show you all of the different activities in addition to the regular scheduled programs that happen over at our senior center. You also know that we have a, a very active uh, senior council and they interact with our staff and give great advice and reactions to them as well as support uh, financially um, as they raise funds and uh, make um, recommendations on where that might get spent. And so tonight we have our chair, Gail Smith, and also Beth Lapp with us tonight, and they would like to come forward and talk to you a little bit more about their activities and what's happening at the Senior Center. Welcome, thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mayor Case, members of the council, senior leadership. Jay, thank you for that nice introduction. My name is Gail Smith. I am the current chair of the Eden Prairie Senior Center Advisory Council. I'm here tonight with another member of our council, Beth Lab, and we represent not only our council, but the thousands of seniors who attend the Senior Center. For many of us, it is truly a home away from home place where we build friendships, learn new skills, keep our bodies active, our minds sharp, and most importantly, have fun. During Senior Awareness Month in May, our facility is extra busy with special offerings and services that represent a wide range that is available to seniors. In addition to all of our regular events, this year, we're having a community-wide shred truck event, a senior awareness dinner supported by the Eden Prairie Fire and Police Departments, and a barn dance and resource fair at Green Acres Barn. Wow. For a full list of our activities, you can look at our website or pick up our spring newsletter. Um, that there's some right across the hall as you leave tonight. On behalf of all who benefit from the programs offered at the Eden Prairie Senior Center, thank you. We appreciate your ongoing support. We invite you to come and visit anytime. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. 
Um, yeah, we can actually clap. I know we were going to. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I was trying to be slightly humorous. I'm not even sure how to do that, so I'll just say what I was going to say. But the four of us up here obviously um, have vested interests <laughs> so uh, in the success of the senior. But not you. I mean, I'm a senior. I'm. Can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe in 20 years, years but whatever. Um, the point is, four of us. No, I'm not putting you down for that. I'm just no. saying that you're the <laughs> no, you the young see. one up here. But <laughs> you have to 50. 50. okay, Rick. All right, all right. You're, you're, you don't get so, to vote though. So you say it has to be 55. Is that no, 50. 50. I thought it was 65. Oh, then yeah. Okay, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Any, what is it? Oh my gosh, okay, we all qualify. Yeah. <laughs> you are. The then you, oh, I, right, okay. I, I'll stop while I'm slightly behind. Um, all right, I'm going to um, read a proclamation. Uh, May is the month we're um, don't, dedicating to uh, seniors across the city of Eden Prairie. So pro proclamation. Whereas the increasing number of seniors in Eden Prairie bring many opportunities and challenges for all components of our city, families, businesses, and government, and whereas every segment of our society is influenced by the needs, the resources, and expertise of our seniors, and awareness of improves participation and action, and whereas our Eden Prairie seniors play a pivotal role in formal and informal education, sharing years of accumulated experience and wisdom which will impact our future, and whereas the community wishes to celebrate and acknowledge the contributions and accomplishments of the seniors in our community and recognize the organizations that serve older adults. And whereas Senior Awareness Month recognizes that seniors are an integral part of our community, now therefore, the Eden Prairie City Council does hereby proclaim May 2023 as Senior Awareness Month. Adopted by the Eden Prairie City Council on the second day of May 2023, Ronald A. Case Mayor, on behalf of Council Members Kathy Nelson, Mark Freiberg, PJ Narayan, and Lisa Toomey. All right, yay, seniors. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Getro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the Metropolitan Council, um, the regional governing uh, agency, planning agency, uh, the has that we have a new uh, representative for our district. District 3 uh, covers Eden Prairie and other cities in the West Metro. Um, the governor recently appointed uh, Dr. Tyrone Carter as our representative to the Met Council, and he'd like to um, spend some time here at the council meeting introducing himself to the council and the community as our newest uh, representative. So Dr. Carter is here, and he just would like to make some brief comments to the council, and maybe he'll um, share a little bit more information about what the Met Council has been up to lately. Welcome. Really nice to have you here. Not sure exactly when you took over, but it's been fairly uh, recent. It was on it? Uh, March the 8th. Uh, this year, though. Yeah, year yeah. Congrats. So what happened, the seat remained unfilled for about a year, <laughs> and uh, they decided to just wait and try to bring on six new members at the same time. So I was in that group, but originally I had applied uh, a year before. <laughs> but um, oh, congratulations yeah. on your appointment! Yeah, and I'm happy to be here. I, I'm your next door neighbor, uh, and uh, Mayor Case. I just want to say thank you for inviting me, and Rick Getcho. I, I I'm glad to uh, see you again and meet you again, and thank you for inviting me also. And and also the council at large. I want to thank you guys. Um, I felt a, a spirit of uh, community and connection here, and uh, it, that's very reassuring for a person that looks like me, so thanks. Uh, so this is my introduction, and uh, hopefully the next time I, I speak to you, I'll speak to you more about the history of the council, uh, what the council's doing today, and what, what it's uh, facing in the future. But right now, just this is like a friendly hello. So uh, uh, my name is Dr. Tyrone Ellis Carter. And I was appointed by Governor Walsh to serve as Met Council for District 3 for the next four years. I'm a 19-year resident of Minnetonka, your next door neighbor, um, and a member of the Excelsior Rotary, as well as the NAACP. I'm one of seven new, I said six, but I'm one of seven new council members joining the nine returning members. I'm also a small business owner 
My company, America's Fund Science, provides about 150 STEM enrichment programs a year to schools, daycare centers, and other organizations throughout the Twin Cities metro area. Just like many city council members, county commissioners and mayors, Met Council members serve part-time. And I'm sure you all know that part-time can turn into a full-time commitment, especially during budget time. As some issues require more time and analysis to get a good outcome. My goal as your Met Council rep is one, to listen, and second, to learn, and third, to work hard on your behalf. One of my first steps have, has been to meet one-on-one -on -one with as many mayors as I can. So there's 17 all together. I've already met with eight. And so uh, my goal is to finish the other seven. I look forward to it. Uh, so I'm the other nine. So one of my first uh, major issues is to really uh, just get to know people. And uh, I've most, in the time I'll meet people in a coffee shop, you know, one on one, and uh, you know, kind of get to know who they are and what are the issues they're looking at. Because uh, you can't represent someone if you don't even know the person, if you don't have a feel for the person, if you're not getting honest answers about what concerns them. And as far as my background, I have a master's in public administration degree from Penn State with a focus on personnel and labor relations. I've been appointed the point to serve on three Met Council committees. Uh, the first is the Environment Committee. That allows me to apply my background in education and science since I'm a licensed K-8 science teacher and a certified STEM instructor by two engineering schools, University of St. Thomas Engineering School and University of Colorado Engineering School. The Transportation Committee allows me to apply my previous experience as Diversity Program Director for Midnight Metro for the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. I regularly worked with engineers during that time to develop our five-year diversity program and also to implement it. I also have originally have training and experience in contract law. I was trained as a contract law specialist by the Department of Defense, and I've been a paralegal uh, since 1979. Lastly, I'm serving on the Green Line Extension Carter Management Committee. Our transit system is key for people to be able to get jobs from wherever they live, to reduce greenhouse emissions, and to attract people to our wonderful areas. As a person who grew up in Philadelphia, which is a well, has a well-developed transit system, I was surprised to learn that Metro Transit actually used the Philly system as a model. I recently rode a portion of the Green Line light rail and had a demo ride on an e-bus. And as I said, growing up and using the Philly transit system, I was very impressed with what we have going on in this metro area. In closing, I'm happy to answer any questions. As many of you know from when you first started serving in Eden Prairie, I may have to phone a friend <laughs> and get up to speed if I don't know it yet. I'm still in Metro Council uh, Kindergarten. <laughs> If you need to get in touch with me, my contract information is posted on the Met Council's website. I prefer email versus text, just as an aside. I wanna thank you all and let you know that I serve in the spirit of servant leadership always, now, and forever. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out this evening. Look forward to you coming back, and uh, let's set up that, um, that coffee. I'd like to- It'll be pretty easy, neighbor. All right. Uh, Thank you. Just a, one moment, uh, Dr. Carter. I think um, Councilmember Narayan would like to say something. Yeah, Dr. Carter, welcome. And I just want to say, uh, Councilmember Freiber and I, both of us are in the Commission, Southwest Transit Commission. And, uh, you know, we're pretty proud of Southwest in Eden Prairie, the service that uh, we do. And especially, we pioneered many type of services that we do here. Uh, especially the prime, and you can see the coach bus. I don't know if you ever uh, ride a bus from Eden Prairie or Ch Chaska or Chanhassen to downtown. is one of the best in terms of all the facilities. So we would like to talk to you some other time and to educate you the, the services that we are doing. 
because we've been part of the Met Council is a very important aspect of it. And welcome. Okay. I'm always at your service, and my calendar tells me what to do. That's my new boss. <laughs> so right. thank you. Thank you. you bet. Thanks for coming. Thank you. All right, Mr. Gretschow, um the 2022 Comprehensive Financial Report. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. You spent your entire time in workshop uh, getting briefed on our audit and financial report and financial statements from uh, 2022. Um, so now during the regular portion of the meeting, our auditor is here to present a brief overview of the um, audit and the financial statements, and then you will make a motion to accept our comprehensive annual financial report. Um, so our auditor, uh, Caroline Stutzman, is here from Bergen uh, KDV to provide an overview. Um, Welcome, Caroline. Thanks for being here again. Great. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Yes, my name is Caroline Stutzman. I'm the director involved in your audit. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes of your time tonight to go through the results of the audit for 2022. So the main reason you ask us to work with you is to provide an opinion on your financial statements. That opinion is housed within the independent auditor's report. Additionally, within the independent auditor's report, management's responsibilities are outlined as well as ours. Management's responsibility are for the fair presentation and preparation of these financial statements in accordance with GAAP, meaning they determine the numbers. Our responsibility is to then conduct our audit of those numbers um, and provide the opinion. Drawing a line in the sand, if you will, we can't do both of those jobs. Um, the opinion we're providing is what's called an unmodified opinion, the highest level that you can receive. Uh, meaning we believe those financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects as of December 31st, 2022. We also conducted our audit in accordance with government auditing standards, which requires us to consider internal controls as we go throughout that process. We did not have any um, findings or suggestions for you in regards to that, um, in regards to internal control or compliance. In addition, um, because the city expended more than $750,000 of federal expenditures. We conducted what's called a federal single audit. Um, we tested the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds program and did not have any findings related to that test work either this year. And one final component before we look at some of the summary results um, is in accordance with, or is in relation to Minnesota legal compliance. The um, Office of the State Auditor puts together some checklists related to state statutes. Um, we did not have any findings related to any of those questions or statutes that we discussed either. So with, with that, we'll dig into some financial results here. We have the general fund revenues included on this chart. In total, general fund re, uh, revenues increased about $1.8 million for the year. Some fluctuations that happened between the categories that you see here. Taxes and assessments um, increased with an increase in the levy, licenses and permits decreased with less um, construction as well as additional or, or additions or remodels that would have occurred, and then charges for services increased. There's some rebounding happening there um, in relation to you know the COVID timing, so getting some of that activity back. And then on the other revenue side of things, we see a decrease there, and that is in the inv investment income is included within there, and that really has to do with just the market change that occurred as of December 31st. We have a similar presentation here for your general fund expenditures. Overall, general fund expenditures increased about 3.4 million for the year. Police does continue to be um, the largest portion of the of what we have presented here at about 33% of the general funds expenditures. That category did increase this year with an increase in wages and benefits. And then similar to what we just touched on on the revenue side, um, parks and recreation increased here as well with the additional programming um, related to that additional activity. We have a budget to actual snapshot for the general fund here as well. Um, the original budget in the first column and the final budget in the second, both of which anticipated an increase in fund balance of about 2.2 million. Actual results are in that third column with an increase of 4.1 million, and then the variance column on the far right. Um, total revenues were over budget there by about 2.2%, so that's just under 1.2 million. A couple of the line items that, um, just of note there, the licenses and permits over budget, 
budgeting conservatively, pretty common practice for that um, type of line item of revenue source, and then the investments in relation to the market value that we touched on earlier under budget there. And on the expenditure side of things, under budget about 2.4% um, police was under budget. There were some open positions. And then parks and recs, while um, there was a rebound, just not quite all the way back to the, the pre-COVID, pre so slightly under budget there yet. And this chart pulls all of the information together for the general fund. We've touched on revenues and expenditures already. And then we also show cash investments as well as unassigned fund balance, which is the kind of your equity position, your unassigned um, balance that's available for future operations, which did increase um, this year, about 4.1 million. And another way for us to look at that unassigned fund balance is in relation to your fund balance policy, um, which you have a, a a detailed calculation that goes into the, that minimum fund balance that you would strive to have. And when we run through those calculations, you are in compliance with the policy you've established for yourselves. A Couple of charts here that look at both revenue and expenditure from a per capita standpoint. Um, the first one here is revenue per capita. And so for 2022, revenue per capita did increase by about 32. The explanations or the reasoning are similar to what we just touched on in the general fund um, being the increase in the levy. There was additional MSA funding received this year, um, so construction state aid. And then um, the rec recreation uh, memberships and things rebounding as well as the market condition decline on the, on the flip side of that. Similar presentation here for those expenditures. Um, these are your current expenditure per capita. Um, so increasing for 2022, if we compare 2021 information to the statewide average, um, the items that kind of just show some variances or differences between the two would be um, that the city has you know, higher expenditure per capita in regards to police and park and recreation um, compared to that state average. And then the last chart that I have to go through with you tonight is in regards to just um, the tax capacity, your levy, and your tax capacity rate. So the tax capacity is, the, is that green bar that increased by about 1.9% for the year, um, and the levy increased about 5%. So the results of the mechanics of the, those changes um, did lead to that tax capacity rate of 32.32 at the, um, for 2022. Be happy to take any questions anyone may have. Uh, Council, I know that we had a workshop, so we did, uh, we did spend um, over an hour on this. Um, any questions you want to ask for the benefit of the public or anyone listening, um, please go ahead, anybody? Okay. Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to add, um, you, you, you don't have to stand there, but you certainly can. <laughs> it's up <Okay>. to you. <laughs> um, I wanted to add a couple of thoughts. One is that um, depending on how uh, detailed people are watching or listening, I don't know if it's a surprise to some people that we as a city with a 50, whatever, $3 million budget would hold back $34.8 million and carry it each year, but we need to hold on to six months of operating expense, especially salaries, because tax receipts only come in twice a year. And so cities that don't do that I don't know how they operate, but they would have to borrow and then suddenly go into debt, and that would cost more in their budget. I mean, it would just get incredibly complicated. So strong cities, um, it's not that we're every year saving 34 million, it's that we're carrying that, that six months um, periodically. Uh, and then um, because of an audit like this, showing how well structured financially we are, it allows us to keep our AAA bond rating, which then, uh, anytime we do borrow, and we have very low debt relative to other cities, but when we do borrow, we get lower interest than any cities that don't have the AAA. And I forget how few cities have that across the state, but uh, not a lot. I mean, we're, we're in um, a very exclusive group that um, have that. And then finally, um, um, I asked this question downstairs at our workshop, but uh, how common is this to receive an audit back of such... Um, strong, you know, accoloids, whatever. I'm going to go ahead and say what you said, but you're welcome to add to that. Or at least correct me if I didn't <laughs> if I didn't hear you right. But you mentioned something that, that 
95% uh, um, do not have a such, or meaning only about 5% of governmental bodies, um, I'm assuming that's counties and, and I'm assuming states, but certainly municipalities, uh, have what I'm going to describe as my words now, totally clean and issue-free audit. Um, so it is um, a phenomenal positive statement for the historical, um, we, we, we know we, we all the time stand on the shoulders of others that came before us and really 50 to 60 years of a, a quality of life um, choices made by the city. So that's our legacy that we have continued on. And it, it gets back to um, the quality of life that we all represent from the people of Eden Prairie and then the people that we hire and the quality of um, city manager Rick Etcho and then the people that he hires and our financial staff, Tammy, uh, her, her group. We just have an amazing uh, group of people that are really giving the people of Eden Prairie back. Uh, a very high quality, very good value for the money too, because our levy was one of the lowest increases in the whole 20 cities, southwestern suburban areas. So a lot of that's because of our amazing tax um, capacity, um, volume of you know residential and commercial real estate across uh, the city. So sometimes when, I'm sorry, I'm making stand there, but don't go away for a second. Um, <laughs> but sometimes when people ask, you know, why are my taxes not coming down because these new apartment buildings are going up or we have a new development going in. And the reality is nothing goes down because salaries go up and we're a very salary centric kind of organization. However, we don't go up at the rate of others. We have one of the lowest tax rates, which is the amount of dollars per thousand dollars of value. And even though this report showed it at what, 32 or something, it's actually 28.84 this year, it's down. The reason it's down is there's more value in our system to then pull tax dollars from. So we truly are reaping the benefit of, and not that we're just trying to grow to grow, we're not doing that. We manage growth. We don't, we manage growth on private property, but, but nonetheless, because we are a healthy, economically healthy growing city, it's keeping our tax rate uh, lower than it would be otherwise. Therefore, your taxes, even though it doesn't seem like that because tax city, Houses went up quite a bit this last year and the year before. That drove somewhat some houses being higher tax, but nonetheless, it would be even higher, but for our low tax rate. Okay, I said a lot. Do you want to add anything to that? And did I, do you want to correct me on anything? No, I think you hit all the points, definitely. And, and the, what you mentioned about the, you know, no findings and all of that, the clean opinion. Yeah, normally there are some discussion points or some um, findings related to internal controls that just are inherently present, and we don't have that for you Excellent. because of the mitigating controls you have in place. So great thank work. You. Mm -hmm. Appreciate your uh, work and time in this as well. Yes, thank you. And, okay, um, yeah. uh, city manager first, and then we'll um, go to others. Oh, no, I was just gonna uh, say that you need to make a motion. Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. Um, council, anything else to say? I guess I'd like to say thank you to Rick Etcho and all our staff for producing this kind of an audit and finances for the uh, whole city. We appreciate it a lot, so do the residents. It allows us to do more with less money because of our tax rating. And um, it's important that the city takes this so seriously and does this for the residents. Anything else? If, if not, we do need a motion. I think Mark wants it. Oh, Council Member Freiberg. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> It was tough to get that name out, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a pause for a moment, but <laughs> there you go. One thing I want, want to just make a mention, when, when you think in terms of the top 5% of cities and other government organizations being in this level of audit, uh, it speaks very highly to all levels of leadership, I think, within our city. Um, and that goes down, you know, for, from Rick and his staff, but, you know, it's, it also goes through as far as the elected officials carrying on uh, the years and years, like you say, standing on the shoulders of those before us, um, keeping on that tradition of what the values that those that we serve in Eden Prairie hold dear. Um, so hey, thank you to all of you. you know, it's a pleasure serving up here. Thank you, well said. We do need a motion. I move to accept the 2022 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, ACFR. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
All right, thank you again, um, Caroline, for all your work. And Tammy and team, <laughs> thank you. All right, um, let's move on then um, on the agenda. We need to approve the agenda. So is there, a, well, first, any um, items to add? Any council member reports? Council, um, city manager, Getcho, we, the only, we thing, the only thing I'll mention, Mayor, is one of the consent items yeah. is updated. So you see the golden rod on, uh, for one of the contracts. Yeah, eight um, U. We updated I, that, item yes. Eight U, yes. So that's at your desk. Okay. Uh, with that, if there's not any additions, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve the agenda. Is there a second? S second. All those in, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. All right, minutes. Um, anything either with the workshop or the city council meeting that you, um, as you read through, you need to correct or edit? If not, is there a motion to receive or accept to approve both uh, the workshop and the city council meeting? Move to approve the following city council minutes. Council workshop held Tuesday, April 4th, 2023. City council meeting held Tuesday, April 4th, 2023. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Moving on to the consent calendar, it's quite a long one. We did um, uh, not have our last um, April meeting, so that's partly the reason. We have um, items A uh, through V. Um, and for anyone listening at home, these are items that are fairly routine and perfunctory, and so we clump them together into one motion, but any council member can pull any item if they wish to question or actually vote on it independently. So. Are we good um, making them all in one motion? Any uh, questions you have? Okay, is there a motion then to approve the consent calendar A to V? I'll move to approve items A to V on the consent calendar. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We have uh, one uh, public hearing. It's um, fairly, it looks like, uh, routine. So, um, Mr. Getcho. Yes, thank you, Mayor. As you know, when uh, development projects come forward, there are drainage and utility easements that need to be vacated. New easements are created. And that is the case with the um, resolution for vac uh, vacating easements at the Prairie Estates Platte. That's the residential development north of Pioneer Trail and, and west of um, Flying Cloud Drive. So um, again, as you mentioned, Mayor, pretty routine. Um, need to readjust the lot line, do some new utility and drainage easements, and we need to hold a public hearing and adopt a resolution for that. Great. Uh, Council, I, I'm, I'm not cutting you off, but I'm guessing there's not a, a whole lot of questions. You can always ask later if there are. So should we go ahead and um, hold the public hearing? Uh, so um, people in the audience, this is a um, public hearing. Uh, is there anybody in the audience wishing to address the council on this particular item, uh, vacating the drainage and utility easements at Prairie Estate Second Edition? So, council seeing none, uh, could I have a motion then go ahead and uh, close the public hearing? And if it's okay with you, and we can still discuss if you wish, go ahead and adopt the resolution. Move to close the public hearing and adopt the resolution vacating drainage and utility easements. Second. Second. So, Council, um, any further discussion, questions, comments? Okay, if not, um, we'll go ahead and vote on the motion then. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Moving to payment of claims, which are all the expenditures, the bills that we paid throughout the now and last meeting, which is a month ago. Um, any questions you had on any, um, I, I use the uh, metaphor checks that were cut, but any items that, um, expenditures that you wanted to question. If not, is there then a motion to approve the payment of claims? I move to approve the payment of claims as submitted. Second. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Council Member Freiberg? Aye. Council Member Narayan? Aye. Council Member Nelson? Aye. Council Member Toomey? Aye. Mayor Case? Aye. All right. Um, Moving on down then to uh, report of community development director. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Getcho. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna turn this over to uh, community development director Klima. She has some updates, uh, which we think are positive updates that we would like to make to um, two of our housing programs. 
So I will let uh, Ms. Klima um, take you through those. Mayor, members of the council, community development staff administers several housing programs that provide assistance to our residents and we are coming forward uh, proposing some revisions to those programs. But before I get into the proposed revisions, I'd like to give a quick overview of a couple of those programs and I have a brief presentation to share with the council. The first program that we'd like to talk about tonight is the First Time Home Buyer Program. That offers a zero interest deferred loan for down payment assistance to low and moderate income homes or homeowners within the city of Eden Prairie. And in the time frame from 2020 to 2023, there were nine first time home buyers that received a total of approximately $105,000 in loans from the city. The second program that we would like to focus on this evening is the Senior Emergency Repair Program, and that provides emergency loans to seniors age 60 and over for repairs such as a new furnace or an air conditioner, other mechanical type of equipment that they might need in their home, and that is a forgivable loan after a period of three years. Within the last three-year period, approximately $50,000 has been provided for emergency repairs. So the revisions that are being proposed this evening um, include, for the first time home buyer, updating the maximum loan amount from $15,000 to $25,000, increasing the maximum purchase price from 100% of the metro area affordable home price to 120%. And that, in real dollar terms, is a change from about 355000 to about 426000 That is a number that's updated annually, and we're uh, expecting new numbers to come out in May. In addition, increasing the maximum housing to debt income ratio from 33 to 37%. The, that increase is in alignment with industry standards and is uh, necessitated due to increasing interest rates um, and increased housing costs. The proposed change to the Senior Emergency Repair Program is to increase that amount from 5,000 to 7,500. And again, that proposal um, is to reflect increased costs of resources and equipment that we're seeing in the marketplace. So staff is um, asking for your consideration in adopting those modifications to the programs. Great, thank you. Council, um, any questions? All right, if not, if someone would um, make, thank you, um, by the way, for the report and um, the good work. Um, uh, it re really does reflect um, needs that are changing out there in the changing economic environment. So council, um, motion. Move to approve the modification to the Senior Emergency Repair Program and the First Time Home Buyers Program. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, Mr. Getcho, it looks like we've got a Parks and Recreation. Well, I could go right there, but I think I'll go to you just for formality. Go ahead. Thank you. No, Protocol. I appreciate that. Yes, I will turn things over to Mr. Lothammer. There is no action needed on this. Um, Jay is simply going to provide you an overview of the draft of our Parks and Recreation Guide Plan. Excellent. Your Honor, Council Members, uh, what you see here on screen, just to orientate you, is what you may see in the future on our website using a format called Flipbook. And so as I go into this a little further, you'll, you'll see how this will work um, as people go on and, and take a look at this guide plan. We uh, tonight just want to review with you um, an overview what our Parks Commission as well as our staff has been now working on for the past uh, several years. Typically in the past you may have heard of this as a park and open space plan. And one of the things that makes this really unique for moving forward is it's more than a park and open space plan. And the reason for that is when you look back before we were a, de a well-developed community, there was a good reason to look at all of the land and really call out how it should be developed and what maybe should be acquired. But since we've acquired much of our land, really what drives how we um, design and rehabilitate our parks is our users and also the programs that we put in place at those locations. And so we did a few things that I think are really unique and make this uh, stand out from what you would typically see. We engaged our staff 
Um, and we also incorporated that recreation side of things that typically isn't addressed in many of the past styles of the park and open space plan. And so that's why we're referring to this as a, as a guide plan and also parks, recreation, and natural resources, knowing the role that we play in, as stewards and protecting our natural resources in the community. So if you look on the right page, we really break this down into different sections, and I'll tell you about each of those. There's a couple of them I'll give you examples of, and we'll move through uh, fairly quickly. So the first section is about this guide, and what happens in this is it, it really tells you about the sections that we broke this into. So into the future, um, that's really looking at how do we move forward? What are some of those trends and change drivers um, that we need to consider as we're making decisions and whether that's based in recreation programming or also in our facility design and rehabilitation. Also ways we do business. As you learned tonight, um, we are a fairly big business in the amount of revenue and registrations, the marketing that we do, um, all of that needs to uh, be considered as well as under our section of how we do business or ways we do business is how do we engage our residents and not just the ones that typically sign up, but how do we engage everybody in our community and how do we build that community? So that section really discusses ways we do that and then our programs and facilities, that runs you through every one of our program areas, and I'll walk you through a few of those. And then our parks and natural resources, and that's what you would typically see in a uh, past version of this document, alphabetical order of every park that we have, listing out the acreage, the types of amenities. Um, and then we will also look at the appendix the really nice part about putting this in this flipbook format and having it online, it can always be a living and updated document. We don't have to wait another seven, 10, 12 years before we update it, print it, put it in a three ring binder. The other pieces that I'll point out along the way is many of these things will have hot links to them. And so if you wanna dig deeper, you can connect on water quality issues right to Nine Mile Creek, and it'll talk more specifically about um, that lake or that creek that occurs in that watershed district. Same way as we talk about our partners or our athletic um, associations that we work with, you'll be able to hotlink right to their, their websites and have the most up-to-date uh, version of what they're putting out. And then the appendix um, also goes into many of the reports that we relied on uh, to build this guide plan. So um, you'll look back and uh, as you'll see, we had a, a plan in 1965, 1989 and 2003. And so as we were putting together and helping with the uh, park and open space portion of the Aspire 2040, and also the work that took place with Aspire 2040 on some of our demographic information, that really became the perfect timing and the perfect building blocks to then leverage for um, putting this guide plan uh, together. This also relies on many of the updates to other plans that we brought to you, especially recently, some like the Urban Forestry Master Plan, the Sport Trends Report, and again, these reports will have hot links to them so you can go directly to the details of those reports if you want to do that. Um, a few more of the recently updated plans, but also how did we um, develop this plan in specific? Um, one, again, we added that recreation component of the programming, but also looked at a lot of those trends of how people are using um, our facilities and also our recreation programs. We looked at staff input, and what I tell many people about our city and about our department is, we're fortunate enough to have a large enough city where we hire experts in their areas of programming. So the person that works at our arts center is an expert in the area of arts. Our person who works in adult athletics has expertise and training in those areas. And so you'll see how we leverage that um, with their expertise. So instead of going out and, and getting a consultant to help us write it and help them understand our own information, we really relied on people internally. Our use of the consultant has been helpful. We used uh, ISG and they have helped us with the writing and the formatting 
of our actual text and information in the layout of this uh, document. So you'll see some things like call out boxes that, and uh, a good theme throughout the document. Um, you'll also, um, as we go through the history of how the document was developed, we've been fortunate to draw from our Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources Commission members. There have been many, of many times, starting in 2019, um, that they've gone through visioning exercises with us and helped us understand um, where they come from as, as community members and representing our entire community. So again, after 2018 and the 2040 Aspire process, we started in 2019 and started working on this in, a, in getting the format, the type of text that we wanted, but then uh, COVID hits in 2020 and we put a pause on it. And as we came out of COVID, we said we need a little bit of extra time to see the impacts of COVID and so we could really come up with a document that is truly a guide into the future. So we re-engaged again in 2022 and our staff spent a lot of time working hard on this. Uh, Brenda Uding, who many of you have met from our office, has really done a great job of organizing and gathering so much of the information and coordinating this. And our three managers have also worked with all of their program supervisors or maintenance supervisors to really make this as rich and, and in depth of a document as, as we could do. We've recently reviewed this very similarly with our Parks, Recreation and Natural Resources Commission to get any of their thoughts and feedback. And so tonight we'd like to do that same thing uh, with you. So input and feedback is a big part and we have many ways that, as you know, that we get our feedback from residents. And so we list uh, those different ways uh, that we hear and learn what people in our community are looking for and what they like. We've got one that is uh, about due again, our quality of life survey, and we'll incorporate some of the most recent uh, data from that. We also looked at the demographic trends and the changes that have happened. If you look at the graphs from 1990 all the way through 2020 to help uh, inform us where some of our programs may be headed, where our facility design may be headed. And then we looked at a section called Into the Future. When we see these photos, one, one of the things I'd like to tell you about is all of these photos are ours. There's no stock photos, um, whether it's through our communication staff, our own program staff, or, or some professional photographers that we've engaged over time. Um, all of these are pictures of Eden Prairie, within Eden Prairie, of Eden Prairie, uh, people engaged in, in parks and recreation activities. So as we looked at the into the future, which was really important and it, it really worked well for us as some good visioning exercises with all of our staff, we really said, what are some of those major change drivers that we need to think about that are going to drive the way we provide services and also facilities going forward? So again, going back to those things like demographics, income disparities, our growing age differences, and also um, workforce shortages. How do we provide uh, the best programs and facilities we can if it's difficult to find people. We also looked at drivers like climate change, energy conservation, water scarcity that we know is heading our way, things like invasive species, aging infrastructure, and, and then came up with some of the guiding principles that we've worked with for quite a long time, but we know they'll be important as we move forward. We also talked a little bit about uh, system reinvestment, some of the things like the demand now for year round opportunities, things that people are used to doing outside in the summer, they wanna come inside um, during the uh, winter time. So we laid out two uh, ways we do business and um, that section for sure talks about partnerships and we couldn't do what we do without the many organizations that were able to um, be a part of our programming or some that we also uh, support and leverage. So we walked through some of those, including the school district. If you look down here at the athletic associations, when I turn the page, this that high, uh, um, highlighted itself, I can now go to that and I'd be able to click over and be able to easily access their, um, their websites. Marketing and promotion is an area that we looked at. People sometimes ask us, how, did, how do I hear about your activities or how do I find out about your facilities? So we wanted to make sure to identify all of those ways that we do engage with our community. We also, a couple years ago, undertook a marketing and communications plan 
along with our communications staff and a consultant. And so many of the things you see in here come out of that study and out of those recommendations. And so you'll see that study linked to in the back of, of this document. Um, capital improvement projects, all of the ways and reasons we do them, but also importantly, the funding sources are discussed and uh, outlined of how, how do we actually pay for things and make sure that we, in those funds, have money going forward and set aside to keep our system uh, in, in good and proper shape. We touch on things like sustainability, equity inclusion, and inclusion really is throughout this document. Every program area that I'll, I'll briefly show you um, touches on inclusion um, and equity throughout. Um, the ideas of bringing people together, identifying uh, financial barriers and the cultural differences that we have are all addressed um, and highlighted in this document. And we then get into, in ways we do business, what our organizational structure looks like in each one of our areas, but also what is our redundancy and what are our backups um, in case that we do not only a pandemic, but uh, in times of needing to you know, provide full services when you think about our community center being open seven days a week, early in the morning till late at night, how do we ensure that we have uh, good coverage in those areas? So in the area of programs and facilities, and I won't cover all of them, I just wanna show you what the layout looks like. As you can see on the left side of the page, those are all of our areas of programs um, and then the facility rental itself. So each one of those has a section, starting with youth recreation. And we talk about not only just the importance of youth recreation, but what are those impacts of climate change, of demographic differences, what are our strategies of reaching everyone in our community or being accessible to them as it applies to the youth recreation programming and also our youth adaptive programs in the Access for All. And then it, it ends in each section with those future drivers and how, are, how do we help overcome some of those things uh, as we move forward. So one more example in this area, and again, there's about a dozen different program areas, but our athletic uh, programs, which is our adults plus our support of the youth athletic programs. So we talk a lot about the changing demographics, the desires of people, if we think back to where adult softball used to be, high numbers decreasing, if we think back to where adult volleyball used to be, lower numbers now increasing. And so we want to be able to react to that, but also plan our future for where that's heading. So we do talk about what are the impacts, what are our recent efforts, and you'll see that more in our facility side of things, and then what do we have to think about in the future. So those are the layouts that each one of those program areas addresses by the people that are living it and working in it every single day and are being trained in it and uh, keeping up with all of the trends as well as getting that day-to-day -day customer feedback. So I will click, quickly go through the outdoor center, also the uh, senior center is another area, program area. The uh, community center is obviously made up of many different programming areas. So you'll see the community center is a, a general section with membership, charting what some of the history has been, um, and also what are some of the anticipated capital improvements, things we need to think about in the future there, getting down, breaking into the areas like ice arenas, um, the aquatics area, fitness programs, performing arts and special events, the uh, public art initiative, which is, as you see just by uh, photos, has been very extensive over the past years. And then looking at also facility rental falls in as a program area to all of the different uh, rental facilities that we have, um, how they're used, um, how many um, visits they have each year, how they break down compared to each other and then also more specific at the uh, community center. And again, looking at what are some things we need to consider in the future as we're in the uh, business of renting facilities and engaging people um, with their uh, activities. So that takes us more towards the, um, what would be kind of that traditional park and open space plan, 
which is the Parks and Natural Resources. And we start this chapter with more of an overview, and you'll see the um, different types of uh, facilities, bocce ball courts, cemeteries, splash pads, and so we do the traditional tally of things. And then um, we get into that general overview under parks and also natural resources, um, heavily on things like climate change, things like emerald ash borer, um, things like water quality um, and water management, and then talk about the future considerations. In addition, there's the uh, trails and sidewalks, and if you remember, we do have a really uh, detailed report on that and a guide plan for that, and so we touch on that, but that's also in depth once we get to the appendixes. We now break it down into each conservation area. So the format that you're gonna see is if you look on the left, it talks about the acres, the amenities, the location, um, and then goes into a little bit of history, a little more narrative of what those existing conditions are, and then if there's some problematic conditions that we need to either address or keep our eye on. Um, more, again, here's that example when we get into the Birch Island Lake. This will take you to Nine Mile Creek's website that really goes in depth on history and some of the initiatives that have happened on the lake. Each section um, or area has an uh, aerial map to it, uh, and some will have a little more uh, detailed maps as well. So again, this goes alphabetically by conservation area. This is really amazing. I mean, so, it's incredibly thorough. Thank you. Then we uh, break again parks and natural resources down to uh, historic and special use areas. And so each one of those are addressed. And so they're kind of all over the board. We've got our, our community gardens. And again, that same format, easy to look at the acreage, all of it in alphabetical uh, order. The uh, Cummins Phipps Grill House, uh, the cemetery, uh, Edenwood Center, that's another one that we have a pretty extensive master plan on, and so we link to that. Miller Spring, the other cemetery. And then we get to what many people think of our, our parks as, is the neighborhood parks and also the community parks. So again, you'll look at Birch Island Wood in the format that, or Birch Island Park in the format that that takes, and then it goes alphabetically through all of the parks. Again, if there's things that we know uh, might be in the CIP or things we just need to, to keep an eye on, we'll have that both um, in recent efforts and then also if there's future considerations or things that we need to uh, pay more attention uh, to going forward. So this takes us all the way again to the uh, end here, which we'll get there. Twenty-four pages. Wow. It's pretty amazing. So you get to the appendix, and many of those things that I was mentioning, like the Aspire, um, our budget, so people can see that. And again, as that budget changes, this QR code will take you to our most recent uh, budget. So we can keep this as, as real time uh, as possible, and if people want to go very in depth, or if they want to stay at the 343 page level, they can uh, do that as well. <laughs> or if you just want to flip through and look at the pictures, I think that tells a really good good story too. So I'm kind of um, a picture guy, yeah. <laughs> our, uh, I, I will tell you this is something our staff is, is really proud of and it became more than just a guide plan for the community. But as I look at this and think is we have people that retire or move jobs, it, it's a good training. Uh, document for new people coming in and to keep them uh, up to speed as, as fast as we can. Um, our Parks Commission has been very, very helpful, especially as we've talked about how do we think about uh, the future and how do we do things differently because we, we know we're going to need to, 
but it also is built on that feedback that we continually receive from our community members in many different ways. Some of that over time, some of it very, very uh, real time. And so to leverage all of these different documents and build on that was also an important piece of it. Our next steps will be to call this finished, at least until we want to update the next year or the next budget cycle and then we'll make sure that that's real time. But we'll also print some too, because it's, I think it's important to have at least a few of them um, in more of a hard copy uh, format. Yeah. With that, uh, certainly any questions, um, if you'd like to see it in more detail, we can provide it that way for you. Um, but tonight, wanted to just give you a good basis of how we've gone about it and what uh, has really come to fruition. Yes, Council Member uh, Nelson. Um, yeah, I'm glad you've got a lot of it in about some of our new sports and diversity and such. And I assume we're going to continue as groups find a sport that we don't have, that they have enough people who want to play it, mm -hmm. that they will know that they can come to you and make some recommendations and see what can be found for that sport. Yeah, you'll, um, see, you'll see early on we use the term incubation as one of our guiding principles. And if we look back at the past, we were a fairly closed bordered city. Um, if you were not a resident, um, it was difficult to be able to do activities here. And what we found is as some of the new and emerging sports happened, it isn't a core group of residents, it's some of our residents and some other people around and some other people from the West and some from the South. And, uh, cricket is a great example. Uh, they could never have gotten going to the level that they are had we not been flexible on our residency requirement. And pretty soon it gets to a critical mass where then Edina provides for Edina residents and Minnetonka for their residents. And we have a higher percentage than of Eden Prairie residents playing cricket. But had we not been flexible with that, we'd have been likely just turning them away. And so I think that's a good example. And even when you think back a long time ago, that's how soccer got started around here too. And so we expect that more of that is gonna to continue to happen over time. And so that's where using some of those good principles of how do you engage groups is really important to convey to our staff and to be open to. Yeah, residents have um, told me over time that it's so interesting to be able to go watch some of these sports that they've only heard of and that they really appreciate that we're looking at a wide variety. The last question is, is, what, is this live now online or when does this go live? No, it's not live now. We wanted to have this um, presentation with the council and um, then we are in a position where it has been proved very, very well multiple times and we are in a position to be able to make it live fairly soon sure. um, and then have it available. We will certainly um, engage people through social media to let them know that it's out there and so that people can go in and take a look at it and even have the ability to make some comments if they um, kind of it, if it uh, makes them want to do so or spurs an RD idea from them. I oh yes council member and Ryan. <clears throat> Thank you mayor. I just learn everything about the park and rec from the 313 pages long. <laughs> 24. 324. 24 page. At last few pages, I just didn't get it. Um, <laughs> it I just had to say the amount of work your staff has done and the quality is amazing. It just, it's a really pretty comprehensive. Um, pictures are just awesome. Just, they are. I mean, the best part of it. And I think that's what people are going to go through when you flip through the screen on a web, that's what it, one thing I didn't like, so few pages you have a red squares, and that to me didn't match with all the other themes yeah. that so you're doing. You're seeing the draft, and those were questions where we still need to fill in a couple numbers. So that'll go I just, away. The red with all that didn't go, yeah. and I'm not a color guy, yeah. I mean, I'm not the artist and I'm probably the worst, but if I feel that yeah. a, a true graphic artist may uh, think that was a no, that, thing that- th That goes away. That's a call out box okay, for that's, us to that's respond great. to them. Yes. And, and, and the last point is in the links, 
typically on a web and so on will be blue rather than the black color. So it is very visually noticeable. It is a link you can click and especially you don't have HTTPS, blah, 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 yeah. blah. Yeah. It's just, you know, some text, you have a link to it. So I would recommend that you have a blue color. But overall, it's, uh, it's pretty good. I hope uh, you can keep up with it. But there's a lot of information there. Yeah. So the worst thing we want to do, have obsolete information sitting there. And so that's itself is a work. But awesome job. Good job. That is our commitment because um, past um, park and open space plans go in a three ring binder. They sit on a lot of people's shelves. And uh, there's probably only two of us that have pulled it off our shelves in the last uh, 10 years to and take I'm, a look I'm at glad, it. I'm glad you're not cutting a whole bunch of trees to do that, uh, so I really appreciate yep. that. That's this cool. really shares it with the community, which is where, where it does belong these days. No, I um, second um, everyone's um, comments and uh, will add to that, that in our world today, um, it's and many of us that have come out of the corporate world as well, um, it's very difficult to gather together a, a um, ultimate source of truth. Very difficult, very difficult to keep it updated. That's why I loved your, um, not your URL, but the um, the square code. QR code. QR yeah, QR right, code. QR code. Uh, that, I, that concept that that links you immediately to an up-to-date accurate source of truth. So I think this is uh, amazing. Um, I'm just... Uh, so so thankful. And I was just going to add, I was reading off of PG's notes, there were two extra dots on page 282. <laughs> oh, that, um, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm... No, Actually, I, I, I cannot oh, handle no, it I, to you. <laughs> I'm messing with you. When um, this goes live, it, it will be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty impressed now. Hold me to it. Um, I just, before I turn it over to um, Council Member Narayan, just for a final closing comment, um, I just wanted to point out... Um, Sarah, I did not acknowledge you. If we can turn the camera on Tammy and Sarah, and you can both wave just for all the good work that you've done um, with finances and with the city's finances. So thank you for that. Right. I had said Tammy's name. I did not say Sarah's name, so sorry about that. Thank you. Um, all right, with that, um, before we do adjourn, Councilmember Ryan had a, a brief, quick announcement. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. So today is a special day for one of our member here. Um, our friend and city council member, Mark Freiburg's birthday today. Actually today, on the day. Yeah. So we all want to wish him a happy, prosperous, healthy, long life. And we're not going to sing tonight, we but we will maybe afterwards off camera. We, but. we decided none of us that good at singing, so but I just we all want to you sing. You won't sing. Happy birthday. You know, it is interesting that um and I'm a numbers guy and I like dates and all that, but um um because of you know leap years and all that, obviously every year it's a little bit of a different day and then leap year jumps ahead. So I think in my twenty-six years, um the council, mem council meeting landed on my birthday one time. So it's very rare, I believe, for you oh, tonight. I would imagine over the years it, it probably would take quite a few it, years. Yeah, so. it takes quite a you got to stay on in 50-some years, I think, to get another one. I don't know. So, But um, I want to give credit to my wife. She's the one pointed out today before I left. Got so. it off of Facebook. So, um, and I did, If I did my math quickly, uh, I'll, I'll uh, make it cryptic here so we don't announce his age, but his age is the... Um, I believe it's the twenty-first prime number. So if you can work that through, you'll you'll get right to his um, age, just like that. So um, with that, happy birthday! Thank is there you very um, much. any other business to come before the council this evening? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. The no. Would you like to second it? I will second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. This meeting is adjourned. There we go. Thank you. <laughs>